Technology partners are the unsung growth heroes. This is Partner-Led Growth, a show dedicated to empowering partners to discover the solutions their clients need while growing their ability to take their own revenue to the next level. Your host, Ben Spector, a passionate member of the MSP community for over a decade, will help you navigate the growing partner ecosystem. Partner-Led Growth is sponsored by Zomentum, the revenue platform transforming the partner sales ecosystem, one solution, one vendor, one partner at a time. Hello and welcome to Partner-Led Growth, the podcast. I'm your host, Ben Spector. Today's guest is a transformational leader at companies like Reich, a cybersecurity expert and the former COO at Lastline. He's now the president at Piperfy. It's Anant Ava. Anant, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Ben. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So I've been really excited about this particular conversation because I think most of our listeners or anyone that knows me will know how obsessive I get about sort of the systems, processes, data flow between those different systems and processes. So you know, the, an opportunity to talk to you, leader at a, a business, a SaaS business that exists to solve those data sort of transitional, translational problems is right up my street, to say the least. So That's getting fantastic. straight into that conversation, you know, in your view, what is the biggest problem facing functional leaders today? Yeah, no, it's been, uh, it's a great question. I would say if you looked at the future of work and what's happening uh, with some of the data coming out of the University of Chicago, as well as MIT, clearly with COVID, remote work, a variant, of hybrid work, et cetera, there's been a 20% plus reduction in productivity. And in order to compensate for that, uh, we've had to increase more, uh, increase work more. So we've been seeing that workers on average have increased the number of hours that work by about 30%. And that's clearly resulting in some level of burnout, right? Um, most of your functional leaders today are trying to still figure out in this remote slash hybrid work environment, how do you drive engagement and how do you make sure that people, processes and systems are still connected um, and everyone's on the same page. And what we typically find is when we go into a customer, a functional leader may think a process looks like X and I'll just pick, pick employee onboarding because that's something that everyone understands um, where there's step A, step B, step C, and then you go in one level deeper and you talk to an HR leader and they would say, well, actually, it's not exactly how that works. We do one or two of these other steps in here. And then you go and talk to the candidate and they would, I think, about 70 percent plus of candidates describe their sort of entire onboarding experience is actually quite miserable, especially in this environment. So if you're a functional leader, you're coming into an ecosystem where you have to drive change, you have to show immediate impact and you have what I would say a knowledge worker base that's fairly fatigued. And in some ways you have to bring the maturity that your quote unquote fortune 100 companies have from a process standpoint, but keep it agile enough, nimble enough and easily executable enough where if you're a mid-market or an emerging enterprise company, folks can come in, participate and stay on the same page. So building that digital fabric to drive better collaboration, to make sure everyone's on the same page and not overworked. I still think that's the biggest challenge that most functional leaders will continue to face, not just now, but probably for the foreseeable future. I'd like to pick up on one of those stats in particular. You mentioned a 20% reduction in productivity. Is that right? That's right. Uh, so this was a study done by uh, the University of Chicago, uh, or sorry, and it's the Institute of Labor Economics. So they went through and they looked at a few, a few sample sets. And um, what they saw was in general, if you remove knowledge workers, especially those who are in a very collaborative environment and they needed sort of those water cooler conversations to spark that productivity, you did see a decline. And the, the other reason is when you expect people uh, to be in the office sort of pre-COVID, nine to four, you know that the other person was there and they're approachable and they could be reached, but now obviously blending home and work, people may not be there at the same time, et cetera. So it has less to do with maybe someone streaming Netflix or doing something on the side. It literally has to do with coordination and process. Uh, so getting everyone on the same page. 
And do, do you think that ties into the other stacks? The other one you mentioned was the 30% increase in hours. Now that one I think is, is what I, I definitely have personal experience of it. I, there's a lot of, there's certainly one argument a lot of people talk about, well, we don't have the commute to deal with anymore. And I guess officially speaking, my working day is something like nine to five, but in reality, yeah, I, sure, I can wake up later. I'm not about to tell everyone what time I wake up, but you know, if, if we wake up a bit later, but then realistically, I'm laying in bed at kind of seven forty-five, eight o'clock, probably scrolling through my emails, which I perhaps wouldn't have done before, and then that disconnect in the evening seems to get later and later and later. You know, there's some evenings where my other half's kind of tapping me on the shoulder at seven, seven thirty, eight o'clock, saying, "Ben, come on." <laughs> It, it's dinner time um and i've had some really interesting conversations actually on this show i've had uh, javier aldrete who's the svp of product at active track come and join mm-hmm. us you know active track is all about helping to provide that baseline understanding of what an employee is capable of you know almost like a fitbit for work and the converse, you know, he obviously has a lot of data and visibility into burnout and overworking and not taking the breaks and the associated risks. So, I mean, all of that, yeah, my point was mostly that the 30% um, increase in hours doesn't surprise me. And, and that the other thing you mentioned, that really high burnout rate. But the, the, I'm just shocked that they're, by this 20% reduction in productivity, like the suggestion that in my five hour, five hour week, five day week, a whole day of it is less productive than it would have been if I was, what, in an office? Is that the suggestion? Yeah, I think I think of it more as building any anything is a team sport, right? And of course, if all the players are on the field and you're passing the ball or moving the ball along, it's easier. But then, okay, one, one of them has to step out because something happened um, at home or there was a coordination issue or uh, now that a lot of companies are embracing remote work and that is the future, um, you have folks on different time zones and different schedules. It changes the way you play the game um, and the way you approach the game. And I don't think that 20% drop in productivity is a permanent one. Um, I think it's one of those things where if you've been used to working in a certain practice session and you're used to running certain plays and now all of a sudden you have to change your playbook. So for example, hey, the water cooler conversations don't work. It's just not possible. But have you thought about asynchronous communications to make up for it? Uh, So almost the Amazon or Bezos style, like write a memo, read a memo. So everyone's aligned so we can make meetings more effective because I'm sure the other thing that you heard with uh, COVID is the meeting fatigue, uh, where people just feel it's a back-to-back-to-back Zoom call. But it's a playbook that perhaps not everyone's A, familiar with, and B, has never executed or have never been coached to execute. So I'm not surprised that there's a drop in 20% productivity only because of that. Um, And I do see certainly the the increase right um and the compensation mechanisms that people make say hey but i i need to show i'm working like i'm actually moving things along and okay ben like you're in the uk all right fine you know what i'll, I'll wake up at six in the morning right because i'm in the pacific standard time to so we can get coordinated and get this project moving but then you realize wait this is not sustainable like i can't keep doing this every single time we run into a blocker so i think I'm not shocked by the 20% uh, drop in productivity, but I do think, and I'm, I'm sort of optimistic that that's temporary and we'll make up for it. So a lot of problems, how do we solve them using technology? Yeah, I think similar to the playbooks um, and the game plan that, that I identified before, if you think about your your tech stack and an average, even an, even an emerging enterprise company or SMB company has over 200 to 300 SaaS applications. We think of SaaS as, hey, everything's in the cloud, everything's extremely connected, easy to deploy, et cetera. But what we typically see is you have your core systems, so your ERP systems, your CRM systems and HRIS systems. 
Uh, they do an amazing job actually automating a lot of things that in the past we never did. So uh, your accountant never does journal entries anymore, or rarely does it. Uh, your systems handle that, which is fantastic. Then you augment those uh, with support systems. So for example, you may have Workday as your HRIS system and the Greenhouse or Lever as your ATS system. So now you have candidate scoring and a lot of AI to drive the right candidates up your profile if you're a recruiter. But these are still monoliths. Um, so for example, the likelihood that you can integrate Greenhouse or Lever or something in a very clean way um, to work day. And I don't mean just a Zap or a iPass type of a connection where you're moving data from one system to another, but literally for someone to say, okay, we just hired you, Ben. Uh, is the offer letter out? Did you execute it? Like, did we already initiate the onboarding process for you on the back end? Or if you're a supplier and we just added you as a new vendor, can I see if you're a new vendor, an existing vendor, is someone actually taking care of the paperwork, et cetera? To understand where we are in the process, someone would literally have to triangulate the events and go to every single system and, and curate it. And because of that, interestingly, as knowledge workers, we've sort of built compensation mechanisms and we typically call this the long tail. So email, spreadsheets, Google Docs are phenomenal, right? They're, they're very easy for someone to stand up and bring in some information and have the, the manual checklist type approach. But then it's hard to maintain. And then all of a sudden now you're in spreadsheets, emails, and meetings again, because you're trying to understand what just happened. So one of our big theses is as we're going into this new age, we've definitely seen the eruption of low-code, no-code software. Um, and really low code, no code, it's a very broad category. You have RPA, so robotic process automation, where yes, you may have a monolith like a, like a ERP system, but you can remove uh, some of the manual work and actually show the result of the work in some other system. All the way to iPass, which is actually connecting some of these. And then where we tend to participate is business process automation. So we basically sit on top um, to, to help you visualize the process intent. Are we the silver bullet that's going to solve everything? Absolutely not. I think um, it definitely re requires an ecosystem, but is there a need where someone has to understand what the process is? Because ultimately everything is about people, process and systems. But is there a need for a system to understand where the process is, who are the people who are participating in the process and where things sit? We are 100% advocates of that. And that's where, um, what we would argue is as you think about your tech stack, the more connected your tech stack is, the more you can reduce the load um, on your knowledge workers so they can think, of, think about things that matter to them across all of these technology spectrums, the better. And the, the thing I'd like to really explore today is where the opportunities lie for the technology partners and MSPs in all of this. Now, I guess that there's two things and there's probably two interesting conversations. If we've got time, we can kind of have both of them. One of them is around how can they use tools like Piperfy, for example, within their own businesses? Um, but then the other one is how do they unlock the opportunities and revenue opportunities within their, their client businesses? Yeah, um, happy to explore both. I'll take the second one because that's one where, where we've seen... Um, seen it come up quite a bit. Um, so a lot of times, especially the MSPs that are embarking on driving digital transformation um, for a lot of organizations, you typically would hear about the RPA stories or the hyper automation stories, right? Where, okay, there's massive amounts of transactions, credit requests, return requests, shipping requests, et cetera. And I think the RPA ecosystem has done an amazing job um, taking away transactional tasks that were manual to make it automated. What's interesting, though, is once you move from task to a process, and what's the difference? The difference is a task is a one and done and you can move on. A process is there's dependencies and loops uh, that come into play. All of a sudden, you have, let's say, a human in the loop and you have to start orchestrating something. There's many ways to solve that particular problem. You can go into Workday or your ERP system, 
and completely re-engineer that tech stack and build in custom code, et cetera, to stand it up. It's costly. And generally, a lot of our MSS, MSPs get tremendous amount of pushback um, when they try to go down that path because you end up either breaking something else or doing something that the system isn't meant to do. And then, of course, the end customer is frustrated because then the maintenance, et cetera, they're beholden um, to the partner. And as much as I think the, the skeptic would say, well, isn't that what the MSP wants? Because you want to extract as much professional services revenue as you want. I think as with most things, most of the partners that we work with, you know, they're really there to build long-term relationships and provide genuine, authentic value uh, to their end customers. So they're, they're between a rock and a hard place um, on, on some of these long tail processes that require very complex conditionals, as well as there's a human in the loop and you have to orchestrate the full process. And I think that's where I do still see a pretty big opportunity because there's that work will never go away um, and it'll continue to evolve. But I also think what we're starting to see is MSPs, they're thinking of themselves less as the deployment mechanism for technology, but really thought leaders for a lot of their customers to say, okay, if we want to try to reduce your cost, reduce your burden, accelerate the digital transformation in your ecosystem, how should we go about doing this? So almost coming in with the consultative hat as opposed to just an implementation hat, which used to be maybe perhaps um, very specific to the high end, like the McKinsey's, BCG's of the world. Like we're starting to see that much more democratized from a practice standpoint. I think how MSPs use us has been fascinating. Um, a lot of everything from license authentication to project management, to process management where they're trying to deal with a variety of, of uh, intakes and requests. So one of the partners, for example, they, they're, they're a cybersecurity player. Um, so they're, they're an MSSP, right? So they sit on top and they get a lot of incident requests that come from a variety of parties. So they you basically use us as a case management system. And there's a routing and triaging that, that's automatically been built in where it's not just looking at the account, but it's also looking at the account, the nature of the incident, the time, the location, et cetera, to ensure that it's being routed appropriately. So there's there's a lot of interesting applications, but as you can imagine, given the nature of the product, it's uh, it's not one and done. I think every MSP seems to have adapted it to their particular needs or their particular corner cases. Yeah, and I, I think what you said that right at the beginning of that about driving digital transformation is a really important thing to pick up on. Because I think, you know, when we first spoke, I explained to you that the whole reason for starting this, this podcast, this show, was to help encourage MSPs and technology partners to think beyond what they're currently calling productivity. You know, I think the way I put it is that over the years, they've worked their way up from managing the servers and the networks so all the way up to the desktop support. And then they deployed Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace. And they kind of called it a day. They said, right, we've done productivity. It's time for the weekend. And then what's happened over the last couple of years, especially, is that there's, you know, I think probably exacerbated by COVID and this, this total shift to the way everyone works. But there's now a, a lot more pressure on MSPs to, to get involved with everything that comes above Microsoft 365 in that technology stack and how the various SaaS tools fit together. So I think it's really important for, for these MSPs to be thinking about how they can help to drive real process improvements within their businesses. And I think there's there's a lot of MSPs that say they're doing it. You know, part of the marketing pitch is we become part of your business, we become your right hand man, you know, we're partners in in your business, we'll help you drive efficiencies. But then they counter that by just deploying Microsoft 365 and then moving on to the next client. Yeah, and I one of the no, I, I echo your sentiment. And it was interesting. I, I was talking to a partner, and one of the interesting insights that I got was they're having the same challenges. Like if you're an MSP, you're having the exact same challenges in terms of IT shortage and talent shortage that your end customers are facing. So while you might envision trying to go for more complex tools and a more broader ecosystem 
you will go to those tools that are fairly well understood and easy to use. Uh, so Microsoft is a fantastic suite and it's easy to get trained up on. There's tons of collateral out there um, to get even an average business analyst to get pretty effective um, at, at using those tool suites. And I think what, one of the key things that we really aspire to do is certainly if you're very advanced and you're very technical, there's a lot of back doors uh, that open up in any of the low code ecosystems, including ours. But what we really try to do, especially with MSPs, is to say, look, you don't have to, to dedicate your service now or your Salesforce expert who has a deep understanding of coding in that ecosystem to go deploy this process. This can be done by your average business analyst. And no, you don't have to just rely on collaboration tools. You can actually build a real process layer on top using, I think, the moniker from the foresters and others of the world like Gartner is the citizen developers, right, to come in and build this ecosystem. And not only that, but be a coach. So train the end users and the customer to actually maintain it so they don't escalate every single time like uh, there, there's a small tweak or some small change because processes are living things. They're not one and done. But yeah, I 100% echo your sentiment, which is everyone goes to what they're familiar with and they just want to deploy it because it's easy to train on some of those tech stacks. But I think there's a myriad of options now for MSPs. I, do, that, I think that the next thing I'd really like to explore is um, Zapier, you know, as an example. And perhaps either through ignorance or arrogance, many of those listening may think they already have a solution to all of this. You know, my go-to, if I've got a problem, I've got two systems that I need, that, that need to talk to each other for some reason or somehow. My go-to would just be Zapier. Oh, well, let's spin up a Zap, see if they've got a Zap connector. How are you different to that? No, it's a fantastic question. I think it goes back to what's the difference between a task versus a process. So if an invoice has to be approved or if um, something needs to be read off of a document, there's OCR technology, there's RPA, and there's iPass connectors like a Zapier that do a phenomenal job of moving data and connecting systems. What we're really talking about is to build workflow or process applications. So what do you need to build an application? You need a GUI, so some sort of a form factor that a user can interface with to understand where things sit from a process standpoint. You need databases, because a lot of times what we're trying to do, and I'll use a simple example, you're trying to order t-shirts uh, for your employees to ship out swag. Well, you, your HRIS system has the employee address and the name, so you can get that information there, but you now need to go to each employee to ask them for their t-shirt size because that's probably not available for you. Well, you need the database that correlates these two events and a Zapier or, or Workata will do an amazing job bringing in data, but it has to sit somewhere. And then if ultimately you want to make this a new repository for you and it shouldn't be in an Excel spreadsheet or a, a Google doc somewhere out in the ether, then you definitely need that database to sit in your application stack. And then the third thing that you need if you want to build a workflow application is logic, some sort of uh, conditionals, automation, rules, et cetera. So the, at a simplest level, the if-then statement. So it's not just about moving data from one place to the next, but it's also either manipulating the data or making a decision on that particular data set, which I pass connectors, you can do with the string of integrations, but then if you have to maintain it, you have to change it. If you have very complex rules and conditionals, it's very so hard I, to govern I think it. If, if anyone out there's tried to build sort of conditional paths in Zapier, they'll know exactly what you mean, <laughs> that it's not easy. Yeah. So what we try to do is bring, and we, we definitely have the GUI, the database, and the conditionals come together. And that's not to say that we're going to replace Zapier. That's we're, we're obviously not the connected ecosystem. And actually, Zapier, Workato, Trade.io, they're actually partners of ours where you, we use them as the connectors. But we're really, what we're really talking about is to build a workflow or a process application that someone can interface with and actually build a true end-to-end -end workflow as opposed to just doing task, actually managing a process. I think it's quite interesting to 
Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking now, you know, the things you mentioned here, you need a GUI, you need a database, and you need the logic. And I'm thinking, okay, if I wanted to build something out using various bits that I could plug together to achieve this, it's actually starting to get quite complicated. You know, I'm thinking, right, I've spun up a WordPress site with some web host in order to get a SQL database with some kind of management. I've installed Gravity Forms to give me that kind of GUI form-based front end that's going to store stuff into the WordPress database. Then I'm going to integrate Gravity Forms with Zapier in order to plug it into HubSpot, for example, which is the CRM I'm using to manage my business. So actually all of a sudden this simple, you know, the, the scenario you've described of collecting a t-shirt size from all of the employees, I've spun up WordPress, installed Gravity Forms, hooked it up with Zapier, plugged it into HubSpot. Suddenly I've got this kind of, well, I mean, mess, frankly. So are you saying that with a solution like Pipify, you can actually build that, almost that front-end application with all of the back-end services in a way that, as you put it before, any business analyst can just whack it together and it kind of works? Yeah, and that's that's key because the 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 ecosystem that you just just described that was stitched together, a lot of promises there and a lot of interesting things. You get a lot of flexibility as well because you can get bring in quote unquote best in class right for each step of the process. But if something breaks or something changes or someone moved a field in HubSpot that is no longer recognizable or security came in and built an authentication rule um, in their CASB solution, it'll all, all of a sudden just stop, right? Um, and so- GoDaddy automatically updated WordPress or something. Yeah, there's, there you go. There's so many points it's, of failure. Yeah, and then uh, this this is, the, especially for IT professionals, this is the, the scary scenario, which is, someone's built this, it goes down, and now everyone escalates to IT to say, hey, come fix this, right? And they're like, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, so I think having not necessarily rigid governance rules, but the visibility on what's happening and exactly seeing where the process sits and where the API calls are being made and where did the integration fail from a process perspective so they understand what's happening, that's, that, that's a lot of what we see especially now with remote work, um, both MSPs as well as IT leaders are saying, I want to enable the business. Don't get me wrong. I, I would love to give you all these tools, but we need to have some sort of a framework on how and when these tools are deployed. And I need visibility on what your processes are. So when those tools are deployed, I can come in and help when they break. Um, so that's a, there's, there's a lot of those types of conversations that happen right now. What, one of the biggest challenges I think that most MSPs have is knowing who to speak to and how to speak to them within their clients' businesses. And I think that problem is mirrored entirely from the other side, which is the functional leaders within their clients' businesses don't necessarily know how to get heard. You know, I think that if, if I look back to my MSP business, pretty much every conversation I had from a sales perspective was with the business owner. You know, how many business owners in a business of even just 20 or 30 employees actually understand the needs of their functional leaders? You know, do they really need know what their HR leader does or what their finance leader or what their marketing leaders do? They know what the outcomes are and they know what it costs them but they don't necessarily know on a functional level how these leaders operate. So I don't think it makes any sense at all for the business owner to be making the decisions about what products and services get procured you know, when it comes to supporting their functional leaders from an IT perspective. So you know, how do you think the MSPs can have better conversations with the functional leaders and how do the functional leaders get heard? That's a great question. Um... I think, especially with the way the world is moving, um, I'll use this term very broadly, but taking an agile approach, um, I'll, especially the types of issues that we run into, which is process related, you may think you know 
you want X. So if you want your suppliers to interact with you like this, okay, this is what needs to happen. You need to go here. You need to fill out this form. Here's what you need to do, et cetera. And maybe the owner is frustrated because they missed the key delivery or because of all of the issues that we're seeing in the supply chain. They, they come in and they say, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to fix without understanding the nuances. But a lot of times when you start going through it, you're like, oh, I forgot about this step or actually that cannot be solved and we need a workaround from a process standpoint here. You start discovering things. And a lot of, a lot of times when we talk to our direct customers or and when our partners go in, they start with, okay, I, you, I know you understand the outcomes that you're intending. Why don't we do this? Let's quickly stand up a stack and do some simulations, right? Of the transactions that have to run through and are they going to get to the intended outcome? And I think once you go through an agile approach and as an MSP bring different tools um, to, to that particular process. So maybe the ecosystem that you just described in the past, which is like a WordPress, HubSpot, et cetera, that's too complicated and maybe we can't stand up fast enough. So, okay, let's go to something like a Pipefy or an RPA tool and do it. Oh, but we need a more robust database with higher governance modules. Okay, later on, we can come back and fix this with a, with a SQL database or we'll come in and say, oh no, HubSpot has to be your system of record and they can't be alternative systems of record. You can always come back on some of the things that you may have missed but taking an agile approach, building it out, going back to the business owner and the functional leaders to drive alignment as you're going through the process, that seems to be the best approach. Um, and it's an, actually a very easy way to reconcile both the business owner slash the decision maker, as well as the frontline workers or the functional leaders who are dealing with the problems day in and day out. So in my past, I would say like, um, Data-driven decisions are very powerful because fact is a fact. These are process-driven decisions, right? So, hey, like I'm showing you, like it, it is right here. This is the process. And I know you wanted X, Y, Z, but it doesn't make sense because here's the challenges that we're running into. And we would recommend this other toolkit or this other tool belt uh, as we were deploying a very, very quick, agile approach on just standing up the basic process so we can see where things go wrong. So it, it's almost like kind of delivering a de DevOps proof of concept in a way. You could use the platform to be able to very quickly actually spin up a working prototype that you know, you know that there may be compliance, you know, HIPAA compliance, for example. You know, you know there are going to be issues down the line, but at least you can prove you can do a proof of concept, see if the change to the workflow stacks up. And then once you've built it out and you understand how it needs to work, then you could go away and actually spend six months fully developing it natively within your platforms. Is that kind of what you're suggesting when one use case is there? hundred percent. I think there's a use case of prototyping to dev, um, but the other use case is also there are certain things that don't need that rigidity, like for example, HIPAA compliance, where, okay, I, we, for example, as Pipefy, we, we are not HIPAA compliant, um, but we have choices. You can do a single tenant deployment or you don't give us the data. It's, it's in your system. And we, we basically mirror some of the sort of abstracted data for us to execute the workflow. But in order to realize that that's a workaround or that's a gap or that's some, how necessary is that particular process in your step? You first need to model the full process out to see where those gaps emerge and then align with all of the different stakeholders. So in this case, it would be compliance and security to say, okay, we know we, we will need help here. So let's stand up a single tenant instance and this is how we're going to get around it. Um, that is going to be, I think the way of the future, because a lot of the processes that we're talking about, we're, we're not talking about debits and credits in an accounting system where there's no debate anymore on how that should actually execute in the system. There's no right answer for a lot of these processes. It's a question of execution bandwidth and des basic design. Like what, what will the system and the organization tolerate? So 
that's why I, I do think it has to be that evolving conversation. And the most important thing that we definitely guide our end customers or, 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 and certainly our MSPs do is it's not done. So just because you deployed something, it's not over. Things break, processes change, things evolve, but you need something that's flexible um, that and malleable enough that it can move as those processes and situations change as opposed to something as rigid like an ERP system or a CRM system where inherently that's how they're designed to be because uh, they're, they're very, very good systems of records with a lot of controls on what you can and cannot do in those systems. Yeah, it, there's there's a whole other conversation in there that we definitely don't have time for. You know, actually, actually next week I'm uh, giving a, a talk at an event specifically about process paralysis, and we're going to be looking at how you know the changes you can make. Not psychologically is not the right word, but the changes you need to make as a leader to ensure that you don't get caught up in that process paralysis. Accept the fact, make peace with the fact that your processes will never be perfect, and so hearing you talking there about the malleability, having tools that allow malleability to exist within processes, I think is really exciting and, and ties in well with that. Um, mo moving on slightly from the technology, although actually, no, b before we move on, you, you mentioned this routing and triaging use case that one of your MSP partners is, is using. Um, you know, let's make this really relatable for the MSPs listening to this today. You know, can you flesh out and explain in a bit more detail how they're using the platform to do the routing and triaging? Yeah, and it's uh, I'll I'll maybe speak to it in concept because this is this is obviously very specific to security, but um, in in general on on what happens with MSPs. So an MSP, you know, as small as a 20 person shop to as big as hundreds and thousands of people. Um, you have specific knowledge workers that are doing different things. Uh, so you may have a dedicated, um, a de a, a, an operation that's dedicated, but a lot of times we don't see that. We actually see a distributed org that's working on subsets uh, of areas for different clients. So for example, you might be a workday expert, or you might be a security expert for phishing attacks, or you might be a network security expert. So whatever it might be, your forte is that. And because again, uh, technical knowledge is short <laughs> and it's scarce, uh, you just have to you just have to make sure that you deploy these resources in the most effective way. So generally, what we see it, from a tech stack perspective is there's some sort of ticketing system that's sitting on top where something happens, an incident happens, or there's a bug in Workday, or there's a change that has to come in. That is the first step in the journey where it's been logged. And let's just call that the system of record on an event actually occurred. But then there's a whole set of routing and sequences that need to happen. And it's not as simple as going to Zendesk and programming it or Freshdesk or, or, or case management system because, hey, I noticed in, in this particular case, I, I noticed um, there was a, a potential file that I downloaded, but nothing happened. Uh, but I think I've been infected, right? Okay, is this an endpoint issue? Is it a issue at the mail server level? Is it something that we need to go and scan now, all of the devices. There's a lot of questions. When did this happen, right? Were you on a VPN? Were you not on a VPN? So there's a lot of collaboration that has to go back and forth. And the challenge with the ticketing system is you're going back and forth with the end customer, but there's also internal collaboration that needs to happen where you have to remove the potential end user to say, okay, we need to get a team together, like a tiger team together to work on this and build a process or a subset of tasks that we need to go through to execute on it. So that's where we come in. So what we would end up doing is, okay, this is like a, in this particular case, let's say a tier one problem where we actually need all hands on deck and we need these four or five experts. Let's start, let's automate it. Let's see where there's calendar availability, book it, get the right folks into the meeting. Let's start building a game plan 
go back to the client, not just the end user with the game plan and actually automate all of the, a lot of times like the knowledge base already has the documentation on step one, do this, step two, scrub your system, step three, give us the information, step four, forward us the email and upload it here. So we can basically bring in all those inf- all the different informations from different sets of uh, data in, the, in your knowledge base into one document as a to-do list, send it back to the customer, or the end user in this case, and they'll come back and start doing it. And the entire team can see the deliverables that the end user makes, so they're coordinated. And the most important thing is the end user and the customer knows where they are from a status perspective and where we are in the triage and resolution process, in this case, from a security standpoint. So that would be an interesting use case, right? Um, of, of, of how we would be used where you have a distributed team as an MSP, different expertise, et cetera. You have a playbook in mind, but when and which playbook gets executed is determined by Pipify as the routing layer sitting on top. And then we build a workflow application for you, depending on what what just happened. I I think that's a a really interesting use case that because, you know, when you first mentioned the the routing and triaging, I'm thinking, well, most MSPs have a PSA, professional services automation tool, the popular PSAs, auto task, connect wise, halo PSA, making a lot of noise now, pretty cool. Um, There's a lot of them out there. And they have some very basic, you know, documentation functions. They have the concept of a playbook. You can create checklists. You can assign ticket categories, but they're all very static and they're very isolated bits of processes. Like with enough configuration in Autotask, I could say that if a ticket comes in from that client with Mm -hmm. these keywords in the subject line, it'll append this checklist to the ticket and it'll notify that person. But that's probably about as advanced as you can get. And I think, as you've mentioned, there's so much more. You know, if, if, if Autotask stops at notify this person, let's say they send an email out to the CEO because it's tier one, it's something big has to happen. But then the CEO needs to be awake. They need to be on their phone. They, you know, so many places that even that can fall down. Um, and so I guess to have a platform that you can get part you know start to assemble the various bits of information that you do know and more intelligently make decisions pull together other resources i love that example about finding a calendar time when these three people all happen to be available like scheduling a meeting i mean even just the most basic the number of times in my day when i think i wish i just had you know those um uh, elgato or whatever they are those stream deck buttons that people have you know i wish i sometimes just had a button that was like schedule a meeting with these four people and it would just go off to my calendar find a time ping it in you know it sounds like may- maybe we need to talk afterwards because <laughs> I'm, I'm envisaging a world and it begins next week where i have colorful buttons i just have you know like world domination buttons and if i need a meeting with those three people just hit the button it sounds like yeah. it's all possible <laughs> no it definitely is i think and again our we definitely don't have every single superpower in the toolkit, but that's where as a well, that's automation funny. platform, <laughs> uh, as, as an automation platform, we can definitely bring in the right partners uh, into, into that e- the tech stack. But the key thing is everything's in one place, right? Like who are the three people and whose calendars need to be orchestrated? We can definitely determine that. Now, if you want natural language processing and advanced AI capabilities, okay, we're definitely not that, but we know we can partner with AWS and Google to give you some of that or an Abbey to do document processing. So I think that's been, it's been eye-opening in terms of being an ecosystem player and not just a point solution. Yeah. Um, this podcast is, is very kindly sponsored by Zomentum, which is a sales and revenue platform built specifically for MSPs. So the obvious question, you know, can you tell me about one of your most memorable sales? I think one of the, the, the most interesting sales always happen where um, you're, not, you're not expecting that serendipitous moment and you're going through a conversation and the customer kind of gets it and they're actually able to describe what you do even better than you can describe it yourself. I think one of the 
especially for a horizontal platform like ours, um, where the art of what's possible is infinite. Um, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And a lot of times how I might describe it might be very different than uh, how a customer of ours can describe it. And I remember this distinctly, um, one of our customers, Plastique, um, so the CFO there, he's, while he's a CFO, I think of him more as the ops guru for the organization. And we, we were just having a casual breakfast and I was describing, here's what we can do. Here's what happens, et cetera. And then all of a sudden he stops me and he just starts hammering through like the 101 different use cases and all of the other things that we should be doing. And I said, wow, like this is, this is great. Yeah. You get it. Um, you, you get what we do and you get it and you've put it in, words and you've described it in ways that I even cannot do. Um, so I think that was one of the best sale processes because we, I think we just went through that extremely quickly. It was about a week and we were up and running um, in a couple of weeks uh, and sending up the process. Um, those are great. And I, it's not because we got the deal and it was quick. Um, it has a lot more to do with the vision of what we're trying to build, which is we enable doers to drive change. Um, when our customer gets that and they see how you need organizational participation to drive that process change, not just sort of the ivory tower telling other people what to do. I think that notion, that design concept of what an agile organization should look like and what the world of the future looks like um, with where we're going and the way it was described, I thought that was one of the best moments. It's so funny to hear you use that term, the art of the possible. If we'd been recording this show two weeks ago, I'd be saying, right, note, note to producer, that's the title for this show. <laughs> Literally last week, we published the show with the title, The Art of the Possible. Because oh, there you go. <laughs> one of my guests said exactly the same thing. Um, and, and, I, and I just love that expression because quite often, the more complicated the product or service you're selling is, the more likely it is that the client won't really understand what's possible you know they need to understand what's possible to even know that they can go out and buy a solution for it if that makes sense and so much of what we do in in the msp world or in the SaaS world is about communicating what's possible um and without completely confusing people uh you know that i have conversations with my other half all the time explaining these kind of weird and wonderful tech solutions and <laughs> workflows and stuff and he, he couldn't care less about any of it frankly but <laughs> yeah the the art of the possible love it um the the type of sale you've described i was always i would always describe as an accidental sale and they're definitely my favorite you know when you're having a coffee or lunch with someone as you describe we're not even in a you know you've got no intention of selling to them you're just having lunch with a friend or a colleague or whatever and you start talking about what you're doing and it just clicks with them they understand what you're talking about you know bringing it back to that the art of the possible they understand the art of the possible yeah and i've been i think in terms of sales types or playbooks the consultative sales model uh, is one that i've always enjoyed because uh, i think it's the learning listening and then playing back with the interesting solution or vice versa, even the customer leading you to say, hey, this is kind of what I'm looking for. Can you help me with this? Those are always the best because uh, it, it, it's much more collaborative than other techniques where you start challenging them and you try to put them on the defensive to say, no, you have to drive this change right now because I'm telling you, you have to do this right now versus the witness is telling themselves like, yeah, we, we, we have a problem and I'd like to do this, but help me through this uh, and give me, give me an out. Yeah. I, I have quite a lot of those moments with, um, you know, since I joined Zomentum where I, I, you know, I now talk to a lot of MSPs in a lot of different environments and most of those environments have nothing to do with Zomentum. You know, maybe I'm at an industry event or I'm on one of the online social forums, something like that, having a conversation Someone starts describing the problem. And I just have that light bulb moment of Zomentum is the solution to this problem. And, and, you know, and then you can sort of start to communicate that I think this could be the solution. And then it clicks with them and they didn't even know that a platform like that existed. And the next yeah. thing you know, you know, you didn't go there to sell. Nobody expected to buy or sell, but actually their problem and your solution just 
glide as you said serendipitously together and there's this meeting of minds and emotions where you you compassionately understand the problem and how to solve it and they believe in your passion and understanding and everyone gets too excited and then you know next thing you know signed a contract yeah and yeah ultimately that's why you do a business right like you're impacting the end users and you're seeing you're seeing the joint vision deployed uh, the way you think it should be deployed that's really that's really great to see because like uh, the, the number of end users that struggle with a uh, oh my gosh, here you go, I have to go update the spreadsheet or I have to go and I'm stuck here in work day, et cetera. And we just relieved them on, on all of it and the thank you notes and the G2 reviews that you get. We, oftentimes you see it after the fact and you you may see it after the sale process, et cetera. But if you're seeing it live, it shortens sort of that satisfaction that, wow, okay, like we actually did something really cool here and we got the customer to value so quickly. Yeah, it, it again. I'd, I'd bring it back to that: the art of the possible thing. Yeah, it, it's got me wondering now: how often in any one individual's working day do they just do something and accept that they need to do something simply because they don't realize that it could be automated? Yeah. You know, it can be as simple as if yeah. I'm sitting over my other half's shoulder watching him doing something in Excel, and I'm just you know covering my eyes watching him do this process because i know it could be automated and then you know then on the flip side those of us that have that kind of knowledge that can be quite dangerous as well because you know, the, the old meme or whatever you know the number of times i've probably spent three days automating something that i will never do again um so yeah. one does have to be careful about overdoing it when something you know if, if you recognize something's tedious sometimes it's tedious and you should just do it but there are other times that you know, it's definitely worth taking the time to to automate those processes. Yeah, it's funny you say that. Yeah, even my better half, she's in HR. And uh, she's, I see her work through the spreadsheets and simple things like comp and calibration, onboarding, what's your headcount status, et cetera, and maintaining a spreadsheet on how many do you have, how many do you need, et cetera. And this isn't, I can't, I can't disclose her employer, but this is, I'm not talking about like a startup, right? Where they don't have systems and processes. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. And it's crazy uh, that she has to go through this uh, across a division with 1400 plus employees and maintain it. And I'm thinking to myself, and we were, we we're talking, I just said, wait, but you're, you're the HR VP. Um, so you need to be thinking about there and she supports the engineering team. So you need to be thinking about all these other issues. Like are people happy return to office, but I can, I clearly see like a lot of your time because she, she taps my shoulders to help her maintain some of this is, is on this. Right. And um, I, I, how come no one's helping? And it, when, when I, when I talked to her, she said, well, but this is how it is. This is this is what we need to. This is just part of the job. Uh, it, it's exactly that we have exactly the same conversation. You know, my partner was working at Visa for a few years until about six six twelve months ago, and I feel like almost the bigger the company is, the less yeah. knowledge there is about how to fix these things. You know, when I said I'd said to guy, how you know surely that you must have like a devops team or some kind of who manages your sales force i don't know yeah so what, what do you do you know if you need additional access permissions for something in salesforce so that you can create this new report rather than having to copy and paste everything into excel to be able to create the report you know did you seen him having to do that copy and paste from salesforce into excel in order to manipulate the data <laughs> right because he doesn't even know who nobody knows who to speak to at visa to solve that problem and it's the same you know he now works for a, like you a, you know like your other half a multi-billion dollar publicly funded you know publicly traded company same problem his his manager whose job it is is to you know pull together the customer success data and 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 manage those customer success sort of relationships 
he the spreadsheet is like 47 sheets that he has to go through manually updating like the contract status the renewal date i'm like does this stuff not exist in salesforce yeah there's fields for it in salesforce but we can't run this report unless it's also in excel it's <laughs> i'm just like help me yeah. please help yeah um, Anyway, it could talk about that forever. Once it gets personal, love it. Um, what's <laughs> exciting you most about the future? Last question. There's a lot to be optimistic about. I think um, if you, especially for, and then this is just my put, putting it aside, Pipeify, putting aside like what we've been talking about. When I see sort of climate change 2.0 uh, technologies that are coming out, um, combined with AI, combined with not just digital automation, which we've been talking about, but also physical automation, right? Now, I'm sure every morning when I drop our son off at daycare, I see these three cars, and I know they're doing the lab and testing self-driving cars um, going through, and they go come through exactly at the same time. They're going through the testing routines and ironing out all of the kinks. And I'm really excited to see the world that my son's going to grow in because as human beings, um, we know we spend a lot of times, um, a lot of time doing things that we don't really want to do and we really shouldn't have to do. I mean, this remote work thing has sort of relieved a lot of people on the the dreadly, the, the, the horrible commutes that people had to go through, hopefully, right? And even the hybrid work environment, some of you are enjoying it. But I think the world of the future where my wife and I were talking about it the other day, you don't think you'll actually have a car. <laughs> It'll probably be some sort of uh, ecosystem that you plug into, like or an Uber or something where you just walk up to it. I think that next sort of revolution that that's going to bring, but doing it in a greener and a safer way, that's what I'm really looking forward to because it's something that we probably grew up seeing in movies and Star Trek. And now we're going to see it in reality. In fact, uh, yesterday I was showing my wife on LinkedIn. Someone posted a video of a robot that it looked like a, it looked like basically a blob, like it's a metallic magnetic blob that can move around. It can go around like a worm. And I just said, this is incredible. But they can deploy that to do brain surgery and and remove cancerous tumors from your brain um, mm -hmm. with and and remotely control this and. It's minimally invasive. You don't have to cut open people, et cetera, to do it. That's the hope. Things like this that we never would have even imagined uh, come to play. Um, I think having to see that actually happen would be, would be amazing. I think for some of that, I have to disagree slightly. I mean, being totally honest, you'll have to prize the keys to my uh, V8 very yeah like <laughs> you, no one is taking the keys there's there's something wonderful about a a, 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 the, big, yeah. engine, a big engine in a car and i'm sorry but in no electric self-driving <laughs> world you will have to take the keys from my dead body um where no can that's people fair find you if they want to connect with you afterwards yeah i think if you're interested in the pipe i would definitely go to pipefy.com so i know Every company has weird names and weird spellings, but ours is p i p e f y dot com, and myself on LinkedIn. So uh, LinkedIn.com slash Ava. That's where you can find me, and happy to connect and chat further. Sure. And I think specifically, if people are interested in becoming a Pipeify partner, um, you mentioned Pipeify dot com slash partners. Partners. And you've yes. Got a, a, an entire program already for MSPs to to get involved. A hundred percent. Yeah, we'd be, we'd be very excited. Uh, so it's pipefy.com slash partners. And then, yeah, we have the full program there to get onboarded, et cetera. And if you have any issues, don't hesitate to reach out to me as well. Thank you very much. And so just to wrap up, I, I think the absolute highlight for me and the key takeaway for, for anyone listening is around this driving digital transformation thing and combining that with the art of the possible Remember that your clients don't necessarily know what's possible. And even if the, the leaders that you're speaking to within the business do know what's possible, the chances are most of their, the people they're leading, the employees, don't know what's possible. So you know, go into every conversation with those, with those functional leaders, 
bearing in mind that you know you as the technology person are probably the only one that really understands in that conversation what's possible so really try and think about that when when leading the conversation with them is is to give them some level of understanding of what you know what their lives could be like and truly using that to help drive that digital transformation um yeah and thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, so that's it, everyone. If you enjoyed the podcast uh, or learned anything, please do share it with your friends. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for listening. If you want to get more from today's show, check out the show notes and share this episode with a friend. Earn, grow, and manage revenue quickly and cost effectively in the Zomentum Revenue Platform. To learn more, check out Zomentum.com. See you in the next episode.